the Orla. May 8th. What a lovely day. I have spent all the morning lying in the grass in front of my house, under the enormous plantain tree which covers it and shades it and shelters the whole of it. I like this part of the country, and I am fond of living here because I am attached to it by deep roots, profound and delicate roots which attach a man to the soil on which his ancestors were born and died, which attach him to what people think and what they eat, to the usages as well as to the food, local expression, the peculiar language of the peasants, to the smell of the soil, of the villages, and of the atmosphere itself. I love my house in which I grew up. From my windows I can see the Seine, which flows by the side of my garden, on the other side of the road, almost through my grounds, the great and wide Seine, which goes to Rhone and Havre, and which is covered with boats passing to and fro. On the left, down yonder, lies Rhone, that large town with its blue roofs under its pointed Gothic towers. They are innumerable, delicate or broad, dominated by the spire of the cathedral and full of bells which sound through the blue air on fine mornings, sending their sweet and distant iron clang to me. Their metallic sound which the breeze wafts in my direction now stronger and now weaker, according as the wind is stronger or lighter. What a delicious morning it was! About eleven o'clock, a long line of boats, drawn by a steam tug as big as a fly, and which scarcely puffed while emitting its thick smoke, passed my gate. After two English schooners, whose red flag fluttered toward the sky, there came a magnificent Brazilian three-master. It was perfectly white and wonderfully clean and shining. I saluted it. I hardly know why, except that the sight of the vessel gave me great pleasure. May 12th I have had a slight feverish attack for the last few days, and I feel ill, or rather I feel low-spirited. Whence do these mysterious influences come, which change our happiness into discouragement, and our self-confidence into diffidence? One might almost say that the air, the invisible air, is full of unknowable forces, whose mysterious presence we have to endure. I wake up in the best spirits with an inclination to sing in my throat. Why? I go down by the side of the water, and suddenly, after walking a short distance, I return home wretched, as if some misfortune were awaiting me there. Why? Is it a cold shiver which passing over my skin has upset my nerves and given me low spirits? Is it the form of the clouds, or the color of the sky, or the color of the surrounding objects which is so changeable, which have troubled my thoughts as they passed before my eyes? Who can tell? Everything that surrounds us, everything that we see without looking at it, everything that we touch without knowing it, everything that we handle without feeling it, all that we meet without clearly distinguishing it, has a rapid, surprising and inexplicable effect upon us and upon our organs, and through them on our ideas and on our heart itself. How profound that mystery of the invisible is! We cannot fathom it with our miserable senses, with our eyes which are unable to perceive what is either too small or too great, too near or too far, neither the inhabitants of a star nor of a drop of water, with our ears that deceive us, for they transmit to us the vibrations of the air in sonorous notes. They are fairies who work the miracle of changing the movement into noise and by that metamorphosis give birth to music, which makes the mute agitation of nature musical. With our sense of smell which is smaller than that of a dog, with our sense of taste which can scarcely distinguish the age of wine. Oh, 
if we only had other organs which would work other miracles in our favor, what a number of fresh things we might discover around us. May 16th I am ill, decidedly. I was so well last month. I am feverish, horribly feverish, or rather I am in a state of a feverish enervation which makes my mind suffer as much as my body. I have without ceasing that horrible sensation of some danger threatening me, that apprehension of some coming misfortune or of an approaching death, that presentiment which is, no doubt, an attack of some illness which is still unknown, which germinates in the flesh and in the blood. May 18th I have just come from consulting my medical man, for I could no longer get any sleep. He found that my pulse was high, my eyes dilated, my nerves highly strung, but no alarming symptoms. I must have a course of shower baths and of bromide of potassium. May 25th No change. My state is really very peculiar. As the evening comes on, an incomprehensible feeling of disquietude seizes me, just as if night concealed some terrible menace toward me. I dine quickly and then try to read, but I do not understand the words and can scarcely distinguish the letters. Then I walk up and down my drawing room, oppressed by a feeling of confused and irresistible fear, the fear of sleep and fear of my bed. About ten o'clock I go up to my room. As soon as I have got in, I double lock and bolt it. I am frightened. Of what? Up till the present time, I have been frightened of nothing. I open my cupboards and look under the bed. I listen. I listen. To what? How strange it is that a simple feeling of discomfort, impeded or heightened circulation, perhaps the irritation of a nervous thread, a slight congestion, a small disturbance of the imperfect and delicate functions of our living machinery can turn the most light-hearted of men into a melancholy one and make a coward of the bravest. Then I go to my room, and I wait for sleep as a man might wait for the executioner. I wait for its coming with dread, and my heart beats and my legs tremble while my whole body shivers beneath the warmth of my bedclothes until the moment when I suddenly fall asleep, as one would throw oneself into a pool of stagnant water in order to drown oneself. I do not feel coming over me as I used to do formerly. This perfidious sleep which is close to me and watching me, which is going to seize me by the head, to close my eyes and annihilate me. I sleep a long time, Two or three hours, perhaps, then a dream. No, a nightmare lays hold on me. I feel that I am in bed and asleep. I feel it and I know it. And I feel also that somebody is coming close to me, is looking at me, touching me, is getting onto my bed, is kneeling on my chest, is taking my neck between its hands and squeezing it, squeezing it with all his might in order to strangle me. I struggle, bound by that terrible powerlessness which paralyzes us in our dreams. I try to call out, but I cannot. I want to move. I cannot. I try, with the most violent efforts and out of breath, to turn over and throw off this being which is crushing and suffocating me. I cannot. And then suddenly, I wake up, shaken and bathed in perspiration, I light a candle and find that I am alone, and after that crisis which occurs every night, I at length fall asleep and slumber tranquilly into the morning. June 2nd My state has grown worse. What is the matter with me? The bromide does me no good, and the shower baths have no effect whatever. Sometimes in order to tire myself out, Though I am fatigued enough already, I go for a walk in the forest of the Rumar. I used to think at first that the fresh light and soft air, impregnated with the odor of herbs and leaves, would instill new blood into my veins and impart fresh energy to my heart. 
I turned into a broad ride in the wood, and then I turned toward La Boule, through a narrow path, between two rows of exceedingly tall trees, which placed a thick, green, almost black roof between the sky and me. A sudden shiver ran through me, not a cold shiver, but a shiver of agony, and so I hastened my steps, uneasy at being alone in the wood, frightened stupidly and without reason, at the profound solitude. Suddenly it seemed to me as if I were being followed, that somebody was walking at my heels, close, quite close to me, near enough to touch me. I turned round suddenly, but I was alone. I saw nothing behind me except the straight, broad ride, empty and bordered by high trees, horribly empty. On the other side it also extended, until it was lost in the distance, and looked just the same, terrible. I closed my eyes. Why? And then I began to turn round on one heel, very quickly, just like a top. I nearly fell down and opened my eyes. The trees were dancing round me, and the earth heaved. I was obliged to sit down. Then... Ah, I no longer remember. I no longer remember how I had come. What a strange idea. What a strange, strange idea. I did not the least know. I started off to the right and got back into the avenue, which had led me into the middle of the forest. June 3rd. I have had a terrible night. I shall go away for a few weeks for no doubt a journey will set me up again.